More than 100,000 people have been evacuated, as Paula Newton just reported. One of them joins us on the phone right now, Nancy Ruder. Nancy, thanks for joining us. Where are you right now? I'm sitting in a dry house up high on a hill in Calgary, in Calgary, Alberta. So explain to us what happened. The fire department showed up at your door to evacuate you. Did you expect that? What did they tell you? Last night, I saw the river run faster and higher than I have ever seen in my life. I saw streets underwater. I saw water flowing over the Glenmore Dam, but I also saw police officers on the 20th hour of their shift. Working with such professionalism and such compassion with citizens who were really scared. Waste high in water trying to salvage what they can from their flooded homes. It's rained all week in Alberta, topped by a torrential downpour that dumped 10 centimetres of rain in just a few hours on Thursday. People who lived here all their lives say they haven't seen flooding like this ever. And as tragic as it is to see the streets of so many communities empty of people and full of water, and to think of the thousands of people who've been displaced, it's incredible how we come together in times like this. Holy sh there it is. This is Bragg Creek, just one of the places where water is raging across southern Alberta tonight near Canmore. Homes are in danger too. Mudslides and washouts have closed parts of the Trans-Canada Highway. In High River, dozens of people are being airlifted by helicopter to safety. And states of emergency are in effect in a number of places, including Calgary. During the spring of 2013, southern Alberta was overwhelmed by the combined force of 250 millimeters of rain and runoff from melting snowpack. A flood that drew media attention from across the world, and even Prime Minister Stephen Harper was stunned. Sadly, five lives were lost, and as much as $6 billion in financial losses and property damage were sustained across southern Alberta. And now, six years later, for many Calgarians, this is still a memory that they hold vividly. That day seemed to be fairly normal to begin with and then as the emergency situation developed and we were all told to you know stay home, school's out, work is closed, things are going to be quite different over the next spell of time and then we started to see on television what was really happening to certain portions of the city to Exshaw, Canmore and communities along the river. Bragg Creek, I'd gone out that night and Bragg Creek was being washed out. My friends were unable to join us, they were stuck. They left, they couldn't get through, amazing. And then when the immediate crisis had passed but there were still lots of evacuations, we went to look, like lots of people, from Crescent Heights down into the core where it was accessible and everything was quiet and silent. And then there was the water, which was breathtaking. So much of it so powerful and our normally very controlled and organized city was laid low. It was impressive. And here we are. That's how powerful water is. And you had people explaining, well, the rivers have done this and there's overland flow and then you're starting to think, oh no, they're going to have insurance nightmares. There's going to be hell on earth for them. Recovering that, you know, the individual households or the fact that our skyscrapers, our big buildings were knocked out because all their basements were flooded out. Or what happened at the Saddle Dome? Amazing. I mean, there's no other word for it. My son said, mom, you better get home and check your place. So I drove home expecting not to be even able to get into my place but I, I could and I thought everyone was inside but they were all gone because there had been a helicopter with a megaphone saying evacuate and uh, I, I came to my intersection up here and the police said well you really should evacuate but if you go it's your own it's up to you, it, you it's your responsibility if you get flooded so I went, but in the overnight, I came out onto the bridge three or four times overnight just to make sure it wasn't coming up to right over the bridge here because it would have had to come up higher than that to get to my place. So yeah, it was horrific. It, it was really, it was so noisy. It was like a, 
like a huge avalanche coming through the town. It was really terrifying. Well, I can't really remember the day of the flood, but I remember there started to be talk about us being evacuated. We lived in a really close-knit neighborhood in Inglewood, and everyone was talking about how we'd possibly be evacuated. And people started to talk about whether they were going to defy the evacuation order or whether they're going to evacuate. And then a couple of days later, I remember driving down Deerfoot and over a part where you have a vantage point of the river, and it just took your breath away, the amount of water. It was pouring rain. We were wearing rain gear. We still got soaked to the skin. And we stood there and watched the water come up and up and up until it actually went over uh, the bridge into Bowness. And we were just totally stunned by the whole thing. So uh, that was my introduction to the flood. <laughs> oh, it was shocking. I mean, I've lived in Calgary almost all my life and never seen flooding like that. And lived over here for about 16 years. So, um, you know, to look down across the river into Bowness and see, you know, you can understand kind of coming up the river banks and those first houses along the edge, but to watch it go higher and higher and higher and way into the community, it was really shocking. That was not something I've ever seen in Calgary before. After the floods, the city of Calgary committed to developing a flood mitigation strategy, which includes the construction of berms along the river. But now almost seven years later, not much has changed. In fact, only one berm has been completed, and as you can see, the Bonus berm, one of the more controversial projects, does not even have an estimated completion date yet. But this is not how every city in Alberta has handled things. Interestingly, Medicine Hat began construction on their berms right away, and today almost all of their projects are complete. In a conversation with Mayor Ted Clugston, it became clear that the success of their projects was not hinged on luck. Instead, the city took a different approach to tackling the problem. Can you take us back to when those floods happened, how you felt, what you saw, what you were thinking? Um, so I wasn't the mayor then. I was actually on city council at that time. Um, you are actually sitting, if you can take a look out this window right here, the water was touching the bottom of that bridge. We, on our per capita basis, uh, it's a quarter of a million people were displaced in this in our flood, if you want to equate it to Calgary per capita terms. Imagine if a quarter million people were out of their homes in Calgary. It would be absolutely devastating. So. Um, the, the cry or the call or the need or the wish for, for uh, permanent protective measures or deck and berms or uh, whatever you want to call them was very strong after 13, but it always is after a flood. And what happens with politicians is they, after something like this happens, they all say, we're going to do something, we're going to fix it. But with time, you kind of forget about the most recent or the, or the last flood and then politicians move on to something else, whatever it is, a new recreation feature, or whatever they're dealing with at the time, very reactionary, and then they never get built. Um, and the other, the other thing that happens often is that uh, in the province of Alberta, the province will step in after a flood and say, we'll help you, we'll come up with a plan. But um, if you wait for the province, you'll never get anything done. And I, that's not against the new UCP government, that's not against the NDP government, that's not against the PCs, it's just the way governments work. And uh, if you wait for the province, never get anything done. So after 13, uh, I was elected right after the flood as mayor and we said, you know what, we're going to do something this time instead of talk about it um, and we're going to go ahead with or without the problems. And we did. And uh, how did that pan out? Uh... Well, we're, we're almost done. You, you, once again, I'm going to point, you can see the berms are all throughout the city. Um, I'm going to make it up a number, but we're probably about 95% completed. We have one last little piece to finish off, but it's very important to finish it because you don't want water wrapping around. You can do 99% of your berm, but if you haven't finished the last piece, water will wrap around and still flood your community. So um, we've gone ahead and, and we're almost done. And actually the, the, the beauty about our berms is that they become a recreation feature. So in the past, our citizens feared our river because we flooded so many times. Now we're almost celebrating it because we, when we built our berms, we built walkway pathways. And now they've become some of the most popular walks and bicycle paths in the entire city. So <laughs> people are actually saying they're getting too busy. There's too many people on the paths. But uh, it's beautiful because uh, of course they're raised up and then through the parks and you can actually be up on a berm walking and you can see the river and look down on it and, uh, and uh, it's it just become a celebration at the river in a way. Although it's important to analyze the successes of projects like the Medicine Hat Berm, 
Calgary's berms may face different challenges and might even look quite different from what is here in Medicine Hat. Sandy Davis, a river engineer at the City of Calgary, explains that one difference between the projects is that our approach involves both berms and flood mitigation upstream. So the City's flood resilience plan, which was adopted by Council in 2017, incorporates uh, a few different methods of protecting communities. So the upstream reservoirs, um, we're looking at using our existing reservoirs uh, better or differently, continuing the operation of those to protect Calgary, and then building additional reservoirs. And those do help catch that flood water before they get to Calgary, slow down those flows so that we don't see such high flows coming through Calgary. Um, with those, uh, we know that on the Bow River, uh, the potential size of a reservoir that we can get on the Bow River when they're looking at building a new reservoir wouldn't be big enough to hold back the amount of water that we saw in 2013. So that's why we're looking at community level solutions as well. So those would work together that when something the size of 2013 happens, those reservoirs can hold back the bulk of the water, but what we would still see coming through Calgary and really low lying areas like Bowness, you would still see some flooding over the bank. So so we're looking at solutions that in Sunnyside, Bowness, um, areas like that where we can try and add that extra protection there um, and those community level structures would also be built um, potentially sooner than we'd be able to get a new reservoir up, upstream so they'd provide um, some risk reduction in the meantime before we can build reservoirs as well. In the community of Bowness, however, instead of welcoming berms, some are fearing that it'll do more harm than good. We've been told that the alignment from the Associated Engineering Report will likely change, um, but the current proposal is the barrier would come through this shed and it'd be about three feet, four feet off our neighbor's back deck. They wanted to put the flood barrier where uh, the elevation is highest on properties. After a conversation with Gene Wohler, a member of the Bonus Responsible Flood Mitigation Society, it became clear that there is no such thing as a berm without negative impacts. Um, in terms of what the city's planning to do in terms of flood mitigation, um, I really believe that their, their plans are flawed. Um, their plan to build a, a flood barrier, an overland flood barrier that will not protect um, properties from groundwater flooding. It, it won't work, we'll still have wet basements. Um, the barrier that they're planning, or I should call it a berm, the berm that they're planning would be a combination of earthen berm and wall, depending on the depth of your, your property to the river, how close your house is to the river, and it won't protect the ground against groundwater. So um, their plan is to build a, a clay plug that might go a meter to two meters below the surface, and groundwater as the river rises will just flow under that barrier. Now they're also, their thought was that the barrier would be complementary to additional upstream storage on the Bow River. Well, we know that upstream storage is, additional storage is at least a decade away. So the potential of the barrier overtopping in a, in a one in, you know, in a 2013 sized event is a very real possibility because the height of the barrier will not, would not protect us against overland land flooding in a 2013. Event. So I think I think what the city has planned, um, it won't work, and it's it's an incredible waste of talk, tax dollars. And I really think that money is better spent on an upstream mitigation solution. In a study conducted by Associated Engineering in the City of Calgary, it indicated that even with a berm, very few houses would be protected in a future flooding event. In this map, only the houses in purple would be completely safe from groundwater flooding, which surprisingly was one of the main sources of flooding in Bonas. Interestingly, this document was not originally released to the public and was only made public through the Freedom of Information and Protection of Privacy Act. In addition to this, after talking to Dr. Mary Reed, an ecology professor at the University of Calgary, a berm could actually increase risk of flooding and erosion downstream. Whenever you look at these things in isolation, you think, well, I'll just put this berm here and it'll protect this particular thing and, and that's okay. But, you know, there's plans to put more berms in. You know, there's a tendency to try to solve the problem by, by putting in berms. And, um, 
you know, we have to be mindful of the bigger picture. The water does need to go someplace. So if you are not letting the water go anywhere, you're keeping all the water in the channel and it doesn't have any place to to escape, um, you're just going to build water going downstream. So you're creating a downstream problem. With Riverbank uh, and river ecosystems in mind, what kind of impact would the construction of a berm have on, on such ecosystems? Uh, well, that riparian uh, zone that the berm would be trying to limit is, uh, is pretty key for a lot of functioning about plants and, and their associated animals along the rivers. Um, the plants along uh, rivers are providing structure, they're ameliorating the flow, the speed of the water, they uh, input leaves, which are food for a lot of invertebrates in the river, um, and they often can work to minimize erosion and the movement of uh, toxins of, of various kinds from the land into the water. So, so all those plants um, along the, the riparian zone are are pretty critical, and, and a berm is really trying to to limit the spread of that water so that that riparian zone will be small so they'll be able to function in that way a lot less. What have you guys found with regards to the environmental impacts of, of developing a berm? Is it relatively... Um, it, that was, there were some difficult times. We cut down a thousand trees and I had to make that announcement because uh, you know, nobody wants to cut down trees. Um, but if you go and take a look at our berms that go through parks, you'll see that they actually meander. They don't go straight. And the reason why they don't go straight is they're actually looking for dead trees. So if we try to minimize the impact to, if we're going to cut down a tree to make room for a berm, let's go after an old or a dead one or one that will, it, it will, will die or it's at the end of its lifespan. So you'll actually see them meander a little bit to avoid, you know, a young, healthier, healthier tree. Um, but, um, but we planted, uh, we made a commitment that for every tree we cut down, we planted three. So we have a we actually have a bylaw in City Manchester that it, 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 it's three to one if, you, if the city cuts down a tree. So you know that that was unfortunate, but um, you know also the annihilation of <laughs> during a flood is also unfortunate. All in all, it seems that Calgary's plans for flood mitigation, much like any project of this scale, will have very real consequences for the community and environment that surrounds it. Coupled with the possibility that a berm in Bonesse may not even protect the community from a future flooding event, it seems that almost a decade of city planning still needs more evaluation. But one thing remains the same. If a flood happens again, Calgary still remains unprotected. <laughs>